During the medieval period, imposing castles were scattered all over Europe and the Middle East, overlooking the towns or villages they controlled, and housing a powerful king or noble. To any invading force or envious rival, a strong castle was essential in projecting the force its occupant held. Yeah. <laughs> Inside, the nobles lived a life of luxury, holding great feasts and reaping the rewards from their peasant serfs' hard work. But this was a time when peace was rare. Siege warfare determined the strength of a lord or kingdom lay in the strength of their walls, making the soldiers patrolling them the most important asset a noble had. Before the medieval period, the Western Roman Empire had long enjoyed power across the continent thanks to the strength of its highly trained professional military. But when the empire fell in 476 AD and local kings and lords filled the space they left behind, Despite the constant warfare that followed, a standing army was not deemed essential. Europe was governed by the feudal system, relying upon the exploitation of the poorest people. Little more than slaves, the peasant serfs attached to the land produced crops, built roads and buildings, and, at times of war or invasion in the early medieval period, were sent off to fight. The peasants were untrained and often unequipped carrying their own work tools onto the battlefield and making their own armor, shields, and weapons. For hundreds of years, this is how battles were fought, with the peasants proving to be highly motivated in warding off invaders in their homeland. These times were nothing if not chaotic, and the raids, pillages, and invasions of rival lords and foreign conquerors were a constant threat to life. From around the 9th century, castles began to be constructed first built of wood and later upgraded to stone, and villages and towns developed around them for protection. Over time, the defense of these castles and towns was a job far beyond the ragtag bunch of unskilled and terrified peasants wielding pitchforks into battle. As castles became larger and stronger and their lords more powerful, a professional military was needed, much like the Romans had used with great success before. Defending their lord's castle and land from invasion, soldiers were there to protect him and his family, always ready for war at a moment's notice. As well as being powerful defensive fortresses to protect those within, castles were also their own little communities, housing servants, guards, and entertainers. A typical medieval castle would consist of an outer wall, called a bailey, surrounded by a moat or ditch. To keep away unwelcome visitors, a drawbridge and portcullis were raised and lowered accordingly, and either side were the gatehouses, also known as barbicans. To someone below looking up at this structure, they must have seemed impenetrable. Inside those walls, the keep and great hall housed everyone else, and is where most of the hustle and bustle of castle life took place. As the tallest building of the castle, a watchtower stood atop the keep with sentries keeping an eye on the horizon. The wealthy noble and his family lived in luxury, waited on by dozens of servants, holding feasts, being entertained by jesters, jugglers, and singers, and protected by the soldiers who were working round the clock to keep them safe. The soldiers' duties included standing guard at the gate, opening and closing the portcullis and drawbridge when needed, guarding the nobles, and patrolling the battlements against thieves or assassins. In peacetime, there would only be a handful of them in the castle, and their immediate command was a constable or castellan in place to issue orders and assign work as needed. The soldiers were recruited from the freemen, the portion of peasants not bound to the land as serfs. Free to choose their own career, becoming a professional soldier was a dangerous but respectable path that in peacetime offered comfort and living conditions they'd otherwise never be able to enjoy. They were safe ate well, slept in comfortable beds, walked on clean stone floors, and received a good wage. While most of the luxuries of castle life were beyond their reach, it was still far better than the smelly, filthy villages below, with houses made of straw and dung and streets flowing with sewage. But while the day-to-day -day of a soldier's life in the castle was safe and straightforward, the threat of the enemy was never far away. 
Their nobles, loyal to the king in return for the land they governed, could send them off to a distant war at a moment's notice. But often, the biggest threat was found at home. Medieval warfare was focused around the siege of a castle, with the plan of invaders to either try and take it for themselves or pummel it into terms of surrender. From around the 11th century, castles became more prominent and far harder to breach by normal means, and in return, that led to more effective and destructive siege technologies. While soldiers' numbers in the castle were low at peacetime, when wars waged and enemies approached, as many as possible were packed inside for the defense. They will have been well prepared for this moment. The walls themselves were sometimes six meters thick, and soldiers patrolled the battlements and bastions keeping watch, ready to rain down arrows if needed. Typically, a siege would not come unannounced. They were expensive, risky, and usually a last resort once negotiations had failed. To signal their intent to lay siege, the attackers would raise a flag or fire a volley of arrows against the castle gates. Arrows would go both ways, and heavier weaponry like catapults was fired at the walls. These could come in various forms, such as the balista, the manganelle, and the trebuchet. They launched stones and flaming objects over the walls, but it was not unusual for them to also fire the dead bodies of captured soldiers over the walls in an attempt to spread disease and force surrender. Attackers would hook scaling ladders onto the walls and climb up, holding their shields over their heads for protection. Defenders would toss these ladders back and throw down stones, quicklime, and burning oils to keep them at bay. But from the 13th century, cannons were more readily available, blasting through walls and making sieges even more destructive. Massive timber war machines known as siege towers were also introduced, making the scaling of walls much safer for the attackers. Whether on the walls or outside the gates, both sides clashed hand-to-hand -hand using well-made swords, spears, and battle axes. These battles were often bloody affairs, but they were rarely quick. Some sieges could last for over a year, with the attackers happy to sit back and wait for the castle's food supplies to run out. But they would have to consider whether it was worth continuing. Many successful attacking armies would take a castle, then be unable to hold it themselves after losing so many of their own. The defenders, meanwhile, could only hold out as long as their walls and food supplies lasted. During a long siege, soldiers would resort to eating horses and rats rather than surrendering. But seeing the end was coming, the decision lay with the noble, who would try to negotiate terms to save themselves, leaving servants, peasants and soldiers behind to their fates of imprisonment and death. From the 16th century, the destructive power of cannons and other weapons made castles obsolete as wartime fortresses. As warfare changed and castles disappeared, the medieval period drew to a close. But centuries later, all across the Eurasian continent, their crumbling walls still remain, showing signs of a time long gone and a siege long lost. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel for more and turn on notifications to never miss a new video. If you don't, maybe we'll lay siege to your video feed until you give in.